Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Kaya Swift. I'm the Marketing Director for Heller Consulting and we're really glad to have you with us today. We have a jam-packed hour of discussion ready for you, but before we dive into that, a couple of quick housekeeping items. All of your attendee lines have been muted, so if you have a question or a comment during today's discussion, and we hope you do, please drop those in the question box, and I will be monitoring that throughout the hour today. And I know many of you have already submitted your questions, so we have those. Um, thank you so much, and we'll be leaving those in today's conversation. This webinar will go until about 3 p.m. Eastern time today, and I will send you the recording and the slides and resources tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our two moderators today. I'm joined by Jet Winders, my colleague from Heller Consulting, and Amy Sample Ward, the CEO of N10. Jet, maybe if we could start with you and just say a quick hello. Hi, my name is Jet Winders. My pronouns are he, him, and looking forward to uh, having this conversation with everybody. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here with Heller. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I see folks are still trickling in, so we'll fill in some of the fluff here. And then once everybody's on, we'll really be into the heart of things. I'm Amy Sample Ward. I use they, them. I'm the CEO of N10, as Kaya said, and just really excited for this opportunity to talk through our recent research report that we did and, and all of the panelists here participated in that because sometimes, you know, we can be honest, we don't all read the PDFs. Uh, so it's fun to bring a little bit of the data and the results of that to life um, in conversation today. Uh, just really briefly, N10, if you um, are not familiar with us, we're a nonprofit organization ourselves and our work is to make sure that everybody here, that your mission or movement is able to be successful and that we really do create that better world um, by supporting all of your staff knowing how to make strategic and equitable technology choices. Um, we don't recommend any products. We won't be recommending any products today. Instead, we wanna be sure that you know how to make those decisions um, yourselves for the community that you work with, the mission that you have, and, and the staff needs that you might have in your organization. Well, and I'm really privileged to represent Heller Consulting, which has uh, been supporting nonprofits with their technology for over 25 years. Really, our role is to help nonprofits understand what it is that they need from technology and then help them navigate the technology ecosystem to determine what's going to be the best fit for them. And so we do that through strategic work, through uh, implementation of some leading tools. Uh, again, we won't be pitching any of those specific tools today, but I've been really uh, proud to be uh, partnered on this study and, and excited to be here. Awesome. Well, I know that there are lots of folks on the webinar today who did not participate in the research. And one of the questions we asked was, do you think you spend enough on technology? Um, and you know, what is your, what do you think of your organization spending? So there's a poll on your screen right now asking you this question. It's only a yes or no. We're really trying to make sure people are committed to their answer. Um, are you spending enough? And we'll just give it a, a second as folks are responding i can see those responses coming in um oh, the numbers are really shifting there's kind of waves of answers it looks like <laughs> so keep there's no right or wrong answer here uh we will not divulge who answered what um so please answer you know with with what's on the top of your heart here if your organization is spending enough on technology all right it looks like the votes may have stopped coming in. All right, Kaya, what do you think? Should we close it? Give folks final yeah. 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's slowed down here. I'm gonna close it for you all. Okay, perfect. Well, with uh, nearly 80% of participants responding in the poll, 38% said yes, your organization is spending enough, and 62% said no. Like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. 
here's what the results when we asked this in the survey. Um, this is what those results look like. Um, there should be a chart on your screen, but we're going to be sharing a number of charts all throughout today, and we will say out loud also what's on them. Um, and of course, all of this is in the research report. Um, so what when we asked this in the survey, how would you characterize your organization's tech spending? We had 49% said we're, we're spending the right amount, um, but 45% not really, you know, statistically different from 49% here said we're spending too little uh, and only 6% said we're spending too much. So I think um, this conversation here uh, is, is going to be filled with similar folks to those who participated in the research. We wanted to start before we got into the panel with a little bit of context and kind of level setting. So what is it that we know <laughs> about technology? Well, at N10, we have been doing our capacity building work for 24 years now, and that has included research of all different you know, topics related to tech investment um, over those 24 years. And one thing that has been completely consistent through 24 years of all the tech changes in our sector is that there's no certain type of organization that is just always effective uh, or any certain type of organization that just isn't. Every organization, regardless of mission area or geography, staff size, budget size, how long your organization has been around, those kind of big factors have never actually had a correlation to effectiveness in our research. Um, and I, I start there because I think it's important to keep that in mind as so much of the noise around our sector is you just have to have more money or you just have to have more staff or you just have to you know be one of those cool savvy new organizations and that's just not true it's really about how you spend whatever budget you do have it's how you support whatever staff you do have, right um, and remembering that hopefully is empowering and energizing and not overwhelming <laughs> but there isn't you know a magical number that we need to reach it's really about doing the, the kind of strategic equitable work with whatever you have. And a few points, I think these will come up naturally in our conversation, but I, I pulled out a few of these kind of practices that we see do correlate with effective organizations across all of our research reports over the years. Um, so while you know mission area or geography or, or tech budget does not correlate the things that do are, are some of these handful of things here on the screen the first is that tech decision makers are included in strategic planning um, at n10 we don't refer to it managers or ctos we talk about tech decision makers because i mean we all remember that phase in the nonprofit sector where everyone had weird made-up titles like ninja and guru and you know, like titles like didn't make sense for a while but also, it's not about having a certain staff structure or a certain title. People are making technology decisions, regardless of what their job title is. And so acknowledging where those decisions are being made on the team and including those people in strategic planning is really important. Second to that is that someone making technology decisions is considered part of the leadership team so that conversations that aren't just that formal strategic planning process, but more of the day-to-day -day decision making is still including a tech decision maker. Um, that, that budget, however much of it you have, is outlined clearly in your budget and not just lumped in with coffee and post-it notes. Both, of, both coffee and post-it notes, very important, but should not also be in the line item for technology because then you don't really know what you're spending because you hopefully spend a lot on coffee. Um, we spend a lot on coffee, um, but you want those budgets to be some. Um, and then the last two here, one is return on inve investment is measured. So are you really evaluating, did staff time or staff feelings about their work improve? Um, did we save time or expenses somewhere in this process, et cetera? And of course, as we're gonna talk about today, 
training. Training is provided for all staff all of the time, um, not just during maybe the fire hose of onboarding and, and then never return to, that it's really a part of your organization's culture around technology. Yeah, and Amy, right. I'll just echo, you know, I think those are excellent points. And, you know, one of the ways that we think about it at Heller is that, you know, it's not about how much you spend. There is no right amount to spend. It's about making those smart investments and matching your unique opportunity to an investment that can make an impact. And so I've, I've heard um, very, you know, I've heard organizations say, oh, we're very small and they raise a million dollars. And I've heard organizations say we're very small and we raise $50 million. So it's about kind of getting out of that mindset and thinking, you know, where can technology help us make an impact and then making the smart investment for in those areas. Jet, do you want to talk a little bit about the report? Yeah, you know, uh, very excited uh, to have partnered with uh, N10 on this and really getting the feedback of the nonprofit community on what it is that folks are actually doing at their organizations and provide that kind of peer insight into, you know, how do we compare against other organizations? And so we had over 300 organizations um, respond to the report and really will, as we'll explore today, a real cross section of different budget sizes and um, different verticals and mission areas. And really with the goal of being able to look at, you know, how are folks spending? Where does that money come from? How do you budget and plan for technology? And, you know, are you unique or are you, you know, uh, just like your peers? And so this really helps us get a sense of, you know, how nonprofits are spending and maybe help you make some decisions on, on how you can move forward with your own technology investments. Excellent. So we'll transition here into a lot more conversation, a lot, a lot less from Jet and I and a lot more from our panel. Um, we'll continue to bring up slides as we go through when, when there's um, you know, chart or data to reference, as I mentioned, but we're gonna move into conversation and welcome you to continue submitting questions uh, through the chat or the question feature. And like Kaya said, we also have collected lots of them from you when you registered. So we're gonna we're gonna really, you know, pull the juice out of the rest of this hour with this re really wonderful panel. So, Pam Breen, do you wanna go first in introducing yourself and your organization? Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me, Amy. Um, so I'm Ambreen Ahmed, I'm the Managing Director at Metro Toronto Movement for Literacy. So we're from Canada. Um, we're a small nonprofit organization. Uh, we're a support organization that advocates adult literacy across Toronto and York region. So. Technically, we are two people running the organization, but there are 33 different service providers who come under us. And we're one of the biggest ones in Ontario, uh, for those of you who know the province. So, um, so yeah, we'll be talking about technology, but yeah, we're a small organization, just so you know. <laughs> the budget is very small. Awesome. Muriel, you wanna go next? Thanks, Amy. Uh, thanks again, Enten and Heller, for inviting me and promise to this panel. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nero David Ponce. If you can roll your R's, you call me Nadiel. I am a strategist slash manager at Pro Inspire. And at Pro Inspire, we envision a world uh, that is equitable and just uh, really aiming uh, for that uh, world free of racism and systemic oppression where all people thrive. And our work really activates leaders at all levels to accelerate racial equity from a self to systems model. Um, our organization is a small but mighty team. Since the pandemic, we've tripled in size, going from a team of five to now uh, almost 15 staff members. Uh, we're spread across the country, uh, but based in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I myself am based in New York City, um, and we, we have, a, I, I would say, a sizable uh, technology budget that we use and operate with, uh, and really pulling along the different uh, expertise we have available on staff. Uh, to make the magic happen, especially because a lot of our program is uh, virtual and hybrid uh, currently. Awesome. David, what about you? Great. I'm the director of IT at Children's Hunger Fund. Um, we are also a small organization with about 100 staff. Um, that's funny, <laughs> funny to say, because it does feel small at times. You know, we often think of, boy, we'd love to be able to do more and, and have both more staff, but then also be able to use our staff exponentially um and we look there are people that that other organizations we admire that are much larger we think we're, we're teeny tiny sometimes um 
I am excited to participate in this panel. I'm also excited just to hear the content um, already. I was like, realized I was like, oh yeah, this is great. And I was like, oh, I'm a part of this. So uh, thank you for having me, <laughs> happy to share. Our organization uh, works uh, both domestically in the US and across the world to work through uh, local churches and NGOs um, to deliver both hunger relief, but then also to help uh, those local churches uh, reach their uh, goals as well in their communities. Oh, I'm so uh, glad to have three small organizations here today of two, 18, and 100 staff. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> perfect. So, you know, we've already talked, we've probably said the word budget, I don't know, 28 times on this webinar in 15 minutes. Um, so we wanted to start with budget because we know that's just such a, a big piece of the conversation. And the report does talk about budget. Um, I think what was not necessarily striking to me about the results from the survey but was very validating was to see that you know this this qualitative uh result that we already had in our mind just from conversations with thousands of organizations you know across the sector really did play out in the results and that was that for the most part organizations fund their own tech that it is not something that is explicitly or directly funded through you know some of these other fundraising channels so here's what the chart looks like uh, from the report and as you can see if you are looking and um, at the at the top um, like I said we'll talk these through and everything's also in the accessible PDF but uh, when we asked folks again regardless of their own overall budget size or missionary et cetera how do you get revenue to support your tech budget? The general op, ops budget of their organization was the, the most significant source. Um, and I, the one comment I'll have, and, and Jet, I'll turn it over to you next to share any reflections you've seen kind of across organizations at Heller and then the panel, um, get ready to, to share your own lived experience of this. But um, what we've seen at N10 of this reality where organizations have to kind of scrape and save to make a tech budget is that it's very tenuous. It might go away because another grant for a program area didn't come through and tech is not associated fully with, you know, the program support. And so then that's the thing that gets cut because we need to move funds over to this direct service, you know, support where, where another grant didn't come through. Or you know other strategic opportunities come up and again because this feels like it's the the flexible budget internally it gets repurposed and so technology projects start and then pause or start and then stop altogether because that internal funding budget is just very uh uncertain jet what have you all seen yeah, you know, these numbers were not a surprise to me. This very much reflects the experiences of our clients where, you know, there's very little dedicated budget um, that's restricted to these projects that you, it really is in competition with everything else that the organization is trying to do. And so if this year the food bank is trying to open a new facility, a physical facility, that was budget that could have been a technology project, but they had to make that trade-off. Um, another example from our clients is uh, uh, go, going through an inflationary period where uh, they had uh, they worked with animals and, and vet bills had inflated pretty significantly, and that has to come from the same budget that was potential investment in other efficiency areas in their CRM solutions, and so these trade-offs are, are real and, and play out in real time on these projects. I'm going to stop sharing the slides just to give a little more screen space to your beautiful faces. Um, and Nara, I saw you nodding a lot when we were talking. I don't know if you want to start um, and, and David and Brian invite you to, to follow on. Yeah, I can share. Um, yeah, I was reflecting a lot on this question and uh, connected a lot with our COO at ProInspire. Uh, and for us, you know, a lot of our funding has come from our general operating budget. Uh, and, you know, ProInspire has been in a position where we've been uh, really lucky for the last few years to have had uh, foundational support that supported our general operating um, our expenses. So, you know, I think we've really thought through uh, what are some key investments we need to make for our team. 
um, being a virtual team, I think it's just embedded uh, throughout our, our work, you know, in, in, in a, I guess in a way we are a technology uh, company because we are so highly dependent uh, on our technology to do and execute our work. Um, so, you know, for us, it's thinking through what are the um, returns on the investment that uh, we really want to uh, just focus on. So, you know, for us, investing in Salesforce, investing in Asana uh, for our project management solutions, these have been key programs and platforms that have benefited our team and just accelerated our work. Um, and for us to just really think through, you know, we don't have anyone dedicated in our team specifically for IT or, or technology or cybersecurity. But I think, you know, based on our current political and social climate, uh, there is a lot of fear, you know, funders um, uh, shifting their priorities and um, a lot of a lot more attacks uh, on our organizations and the work that we do in the social sector um, you know, by the far right. So I think, you know, we are trying to think through strategically, how do we best leverage the talent on our team um, in a way that makes sense with the funding that we have available and also still be able to push um, philanthropy to to see that this work is key and that to do our work well, to do our work um, sustainably, um, proper investment in in our in our but in our operating budget is is really what uh, all of our organizations need. Yeah. David or Ambreen, experiences you want to share? I can go. I can go. Okay. okay. So um, I remember when I joined this organization, it was during COVID. And while it was in person, uh, we started working remote. So I know at that time, so our organization is not just working for us. We have to make sure that we're at that level where we can help our service providers as well. So whatever question, even if it's related to technology, comes to us. So we have to make sure that we stay ahead. So I remember at that time, we, we did look for support organizations that could support us in digital or technology related issues. So I remember Zoom was the in thing at that time. We had to make sure the training was provided, but we got some good free support. So I think that's one thing where being a smaller organization, we don't have specific, we can't even write technology supports in our, in our budget. It, the cost comes out of admin cost. So, and that's very small. I mean, 15% of the total budget is, I mean, if your budget is already small, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've, I mean, uh, I know Nariel was talking about Asana. We got the free version of Asana, but again, then the training is, is required over there and being two people. Yes, we get more projects, we can get more people, but training is very important. So that didn't go really well because although it was free, it was a great software, but um, um, yeah. And then what we do is we train. So we train the staff. So for example, I took the training. There's no IT person, obviously, with two people. So most of the technology related stuff, I'm doing it. So I think our organization was focusing more. Yes, it's coming out of the operational budget. But what do we need to prioritize? Do we need those skills? Can those skills be developed within the team? Or do we have to buy or, um, you know, go to consultants or contractors? So, so that was our priority. But then we, we went to training the staff, trying free stuff, getting a hold of people who can do free stuff because being a small non for us. So I'm just going to go say the word, whatever is free, we're going to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's great that so much technology, especially for nonprofits, has become much more. Um, 20 years ago, I got into IT for nonprofits. And at that time, there was very few like nonprofit guided uh, discounts. And where now you get these great technologies that have great training as well um, with it. Um, we still look for software where it's coming with its own training, uh, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but as far as the funding goes, I mean, it's it's definitely, it's taking into account that total cost of ownership. It's it's how much does it cost to get it implemented, how much to maintain it. Um, I think we've made the mistake in the past of rolling out solutions that we just didn't have the the staff, uh, whether that be within IT or, or without, uh, to be able to sustain that technology. Or we start to like, we want to collect 100 data fields and then realize uh, we can't actually do that. No one's going to sit and fill out 100 fields of data for us. And so uh, with all that, it's really just balancing that. We spend a lot of time um, 
both myself and then at every level of the team working with other members of the organization to build more of an understanding uh, as when i came on to jones hard fund about six years ago it was was very much like you'd expect at at a smaller organization uh, which really fit you know we started in our founder's garage and so at that time like you didn't need a lot of technology you didn't need a lot of communication as we've grown our understanding of technology did not grow with with that and so really for the first few years i was here there was a lot of time spent building up those relationships and helping existing leaders in the organization understand what technology can bring the benefits from it the cost um sometimes that's hey we need to move faster to move on something a lot of times it's been actually we need to slow down um, a lot of our other areas want to move forward in technology um, but don't again don't understand what it takes to actually be able to sustain that um david, so, david i want to bring up a slide to support what you're saying um so this was a question in the survey where if folks said oh we're spending too little we then asked what their uh you know barriers are and just as you were talking about even if you're you know maybe your answer wasn't you're spending too little organization culture around tech is the third highest barrier here so um you know is the overall team not just maybe the tech decision makers or the tech project team ready for this interested in this see the value in this if that's not there well and you don't have the budget <laughs> like it's not, that project's not going to be successful I'm going to jump in here because we have a great question from the audience related to what you were just saying, David, of, you know, how do you move quickly in this ever-changing technology environment where there's pressure to, you know, turn around and pick the new shiny thing while ensuring that you're still doing your due diligence needed to ensure that you're effective with that new technology? Um, so I love what you said about kind of slowing down, but, you know, any comments around that question from the audience? You know, we find the areas where we're most successful is where we spend the most time planning it. Um, not to say we spend six months to do a, a month worth of work, but making sure that we understand uh, that implementation, what it takes to get running, but then also what is that training for initial staff, what are training for future staff, um, what is that whole, the whole cost of that technology really goes into. Um, and organization culture is, is a great example of uh, Technology is not just IT. Like it's it's everyone here because everyone has to adopt it. They have to change their processes to be able to leverage it. Um, that's something we've been really working through with a big digital transformation project of of getting a lot of our leaders up to speed with this you know change management um, project management that they've never had to really deal with at this type of scale. Um, and so, yeah, organization culture for us has been, we've had the budget now for, for a while and working through that, um, but uh, getting that culture and everyone else along with it tends to be, tends to actually, I think, probably be the biggest challenge once you have the funding. You know, I'm curious what your experience is with this question of like, how do you, how do you keep pace uh, with maybe expectations across staff when you said there isn't necessarily a technology titled person on staff, so then like, who who's setting the pace uh, inside Pro Inspire? Yeah, um, to David's point, I think you know it's treating technology within nonprofits and social sector not just a product, but really a, a process. It's, it's a change management process, and uh, I'm part of our organization's teams, and we work with so many different um, nonprofits and foundations to lead them through uh, or culture change work. Um, but for us internally, technology itself is. Uh, its own strategic plan. And I remember um, we set up our cybersecurity team all the way back in 2022, and we mapped out the next two years. What did it look like to address all the uh, low-hanging fruits? And then what could we kind of solidify into set projects in 2023? And then getting to this point in 2024, like, okay, like how do we think through and institutionalize this? So it, it, it took a lot of time for us um, to identify uh, what are our priorities, the project from it, uh, and really understand, you know, what is the um, sort of trajectory of change for us internally as a team, and, you know, addressing fatigue as a team. We, we engage in a, a multi-year change process internally. We had our, our organizational strategic plan. We also had staffing changes. Um, so thinking through what is the necessary training and onboarding each and every time, um, and also m minding that our, our team isn't getting burnt out along the process. Um, so it doesn't feel like there's 
a new platform every time. Uh, I'll add also that I think, you know, we have a culture where there is a lot of openness and autonomy to try new platforms. Um, each program team really kind of retrofits and customizes what works for delivering their program virtually. So um, there's been a lot of learnings that we've just gathered from other team members um, in new technologies with AI or different learning platforms that uh, we get to present with each other and, and think through, is this something we want to invest in long term? Um, and is this something that will help our organization, uh, organization uh, in, the, in the years to come? Awesome. I want to pick up on what you're saying and move us to this next question about what these priorities are um, inside organizations. So in the survey, we did ask folks what kind of priorities were influencing their tech investments right now, what things were most important for them uh, to be working on. And this chart showed really, I think, uh, you know, we see data within here. <laughs> um, so how much influence do these priorities have on your decisions? Uh, you know, is it going to evaluate our program or our mission impact? Is this, um, you know, going to improve our communication with our, our constituents, whatever language you might use? Um, you know, is this improving places where things are already inefficient? Yes, 75% <laughs> of people said that's this, a significant influence on where to, to make priorities. Um, you know, et cetera, saving time for staff. And when when were these areas of technology investment most important to your organization? So this, especially for us, was thinking about, as we've already heard from each of the panelists, the pandemic's role on tech investment, you know, as may maybe you were really an in-person organization and now your services have shifted online, you know, all of those things we know about our organizations and, and the sector from the pandemic. So we were looking at like pre-pandemic, the, the first two years, the last two years, and then going forward. And I think what we um, really took away from the answers here is that right now, folks are especially invested in data, uh, data systems, having their data kind of in order, as well as security. And that's probably not as the to folks, right? We, if you want to do anything with AI, you got to go get your data cleaned up, right? Um, we see every day, you know, coverage of security threats or hacks or issues, right? So I think those are already top of mind and that makes sense, especially when we see on the previous slide that folks are really, you know, wanting to measure their impact and tell the story of what they're doing um, and improve those systems for staff. Jet, any reflections you want to share? Yeah, you know, at Heller, we, you know, try to stay at the forefront of conversations like AI because they are, you know, newsworthy and they get the conversation going, but it's remarkable how quickly those conversations have to get back to the nuts and bolts of just a good technology infrastructure. So quickly it becomes, well, what we're actually worried about is data security and making sure uh, we're securing our data and have privacy for the data that we have. Or what we're really worried about is making sure we have a strong internet with uh, you know, documentation that our uh, staff can use because anything that you're going to use to power that AI or, or new things actually has to have that strong foundation underneath. And so doing that foundational work is often where we start to move with our clients first. Awesome. And Brian, I'm curious to start with you and say, you know, you've shared that both two-person organization, very small, but also um, probably not unlike some folks on the webinar today where there's an organization to organization relationship. You have all these service providers you're also supporting. What priorities feel most influential for you all right now? And do you feel like those priorities come from the service providers up to you? Or are they kind of priorities you're seeing across everybody? So yeah, mostly it comes from the service provider. But it is, I'll tell you something funny. Our website was hacked. Um, and that okay, was the first fine. thing that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean I, when I joined, we had to create a new website. So website security, because everything turned online, where we had all those files and folders, hard copies, we had to digitize everything. And then to make sure we knew about security, at the same time, they had to be accessible. 
So yes, while internally we did make all these changes, so I'm just gonna give an example. We digitized everything. I hope I don't have any paper, no. So uh, so we, we there's no paper. We don't have any single paper. So we had to digitize everything. Uh, the second thing we did was, and I'm just losing my 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 thought over here, um, was Google Drive. So because again, being a small organization, Google was free for nonprofits. So we undertook that. But in our case, we not only had to be trained, we had to train our service providers. So that was an extensive training. And we'll come to training later on, but I think it's how what is required. Most of our stuff comes from external, from our service providers. Again, we have to stay on top. So digitally or technology-wise, we have to be strong enough so that we can at least support them. So whatever comes, so another example is AI. It's a huge, and there's that fear of the unknown. There's so much fear. It came from our field that we need to learn something new. How do we decide or make decisions in our organizations if we don't know? So it came upon us that we had to provide or make sure we come up with new projects in which we can train them or empower them. So that's how our decisions usually come in. Internal decisions are easier because we're just two people and the board is amazing. So that's not more of a, it's more of a challenge how the service providers deal with it. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry the website was hacked. Uh, David, I wonder if we could like swing our pendulum from the two person to the hundred person and say, what priorities do you all have right now? Are they around data? Are they around security? Are they maybe around AI? Yeah, we're, we're um, you know, Nariel, while well, you were talking earlier, of like, well, we can adapt things really quickly. I was like, oh, that'd be so nice. Um, for us, <laughs> we're slow. Um, and so uh, we're going through a, a big data transformation project um, with our developing a new CRM, not developing, but moving to a new CRM and going through that. And one of our guys is going through data cleanup and we're at like, we've removed 90% of the data that just doesn't serve an objective currently in our organization. And so, yeah, getting that cleaned up and getting the right information in there I think we had a, a director that uh, had pointed out like, oh, there's there's no much thing as too much data. And I was like, it really is. Um, because if you've got, you know, they had all these data points they could look up uh, and it was like, you don't have time to do that. And I don't want to be paying for the storage to host all that um, and to make sure it's all clean. And so we've been going through and we've been removing a lot of data. Security, of course, is is on the the, top of, of everyone's agenda um if it's not it probably should be if you uh if you don't think you've been compromised that you know tends not to be true um and it's just to what level um so yeah those have been our main focus our other ones really of of because we have so much legacy stuff because it is so big um we spend a lot of time on on how do we improve our, our users our staff's engagement with the technology we have to get the most out of it um because we've had a lot of technology that just doesn't get utilized very well um, and that's a lot of funding that we're putting towards stuff that's not really being utilized so that's been a, those are the kind of the big pushes uh the data security and then being able to actually use what we have on that note, uh, we'll have a spoiler alert here of one finding, which was training is only one measly percent of the budget. <laughs> um, unfortunately, from the survey of over 300 organizations, it came out at 1%, which was, uh, you know, we, all three of you have already talked about the value of training that, you know, folks aren't really fully utilizing the tools you've already invested in maybe significantly invested in um and training is how we get there so um i just was going to pull up this piece where where do you send your tech budget uh the the physical piece of it all you know getting laptops monitors whatever else you know your hardware and equipment out there for your staff and then of course you know the the software and the licenses and and others from the results were you know other peripherals or things like that um so training right there at the top one little 
percent sliver. Um, but I, I wonder if you all want to share, maybe Nero, we can start with you because you've already brought up some of this um, around culture is what what does training your staff on technology actually look like? What does it mean? You know, and Jet, I want to come back after they share their examples because I know training is such an important part of tech projects at, at Heller. Yeah, I would say at ProInspire, it is ongoing. And I think thinking of it as a uh, always and forever, not just a one and done thing, um, because our, our the platforms that we use are always getting new updates. Um, you know, we try to stay on top of what is the latest thing that can help us uh, and help us improve our programming, you know, speed up some time. You know, I think at the heart of it, we really try to think, you know, how, what will optimize our work? What will save us time? And what is easy and accessible, I think, for a team that is spread out across the country, uh, we, we have very little time where we're you know, face to face in person. And a lot of the demoing that we do happens online. Um, we're lucky that we have some staff members who have come to our team that have previously been really um, uh, active using, for example, Salesforce or Asana, and they bring that excitement and enthusiasm. And I think you know, it's, it's those like internal change makers who have the appetite for it and the willingness to help walk team members through uh, that really makes uh, implementing um, and getting to learn new platforms uh, much more feasible. Uh, but I think really, you know, what will save us time and money and feel really accessible for a team that's spread out across the country working virtually, um, you know, this is how we're approaching uh, training and also just having milestones along the way. So, you know, every six months, let's check our systems. Does it still work for us? Uh, let's check our budget. You know, should we still continue paying for this? How many people are using it? Um, you know, it's, it's part of just, just larger infrastructure plan because um, it's really easy to lose uh, sight um, of all the platforms that we've signed up for. Um, if we're not just like coming together and just doing like our own kind of internal audit. Mm hmm. And Brian or David, you have. OK, so uh, it's easy for us to allocate money to training because our mission is lifelong learning. That's that's the so we make Thank sure you. that our staff. <laughs> yes. So our staff is well equipped. So whatever training where we think that it is required, we do, do provide. We do allocate the budget. But again, it's the service providers we have to train. But I know since the past three, four years, we've been focusing a lot on training the field with technology related things. So I think for us, training has been very integral and it's just a matter of priority. Again, it's a priority, right? If you're not spending somewhere else, training for us is very, very important. We even train the board members. So that's how important we, I mean, that's how we allocate the money. David, what about you all? I hear you thinking about training kind of on a global distributed scale. Yeah, yeah, a, a big shift we're moving through our digital transformation projects, and especially as we rebuild uh, a CRM, is we have stakeholders from the various areas of the organization. We're really putting a lot more on them of how do they develop training um, and utilize, again, the resources that are already out there. Um, we're, we're going with Salesforce and, and they have such a great training program and, and so really just trying to help them figure out how can you provide this training program, really making it everyone's problem, not just IT's. Um, because for us, you know, as, as the internal resource for a lot of this stuff, we just, we don't have the time. That's not our, the best value for what we can do when other people can also help facilitate training. So it's really trying to get that spread, uh, again, going back to organization culture of trying to get mm -hmm. training to be on everyone's minds, uh, not just ours, or not just waiting uh, for someone to give it to you, but to uh, be more proactive in seeking training. Mm -hmm. Jet, what, are there some strategies you all have seen? Well, I loved that comment on, uh, you know, the culture of, of lifelong learning at the organization. Like, how do you get funding for these things? part of your organizational culture, value it. Um, you know, in uh, technology implementation work, you know, training is always front and center and people sort of recognize the need for it in that moment. And it's often baked into that launch of a new technology system. And the budgets for those are kind of mixed into, you know, what this overall implementation looks like. And so folks have a sense that, yeah, we value it and we do it. But they kind of forget that, you know, when you're using something new, 
you don't know what all questions you have, or you start using a new powerful tool and, and actually there's 10 new things you wanna do, but the <laughs> trainers are gone. That budget left when that launched and we kind of forget that kind of lifetime value of the new solution you've put in place. And so what might training look like six months after launch or a year or two years, mm -hmm. or you know, your staff you know, might change and new members have come in and out and they never got the benefit of that initial training. And so, you know, I think looking at an investment in technology over a period of time and really fully appreciating what that training will take at three months and six months and a year and two years out and not forgetting that as part of mm -hmm. your technology project is, is really critical to getting the most value out of what you've put in place. Mm -hmm. Jet, I'm going to jump in here because we have a question related exactly to what you all are talking about. Um, <clears throat> kind of what you said of sometimes when the project wraps up, the training walks out the door with it. <laughs> um, so somebody was asking, you know, any advice around right sizing your tech investments or your tech systems? Um, and they said, I'm finding we're using a system that is so big and complex that we don't have the staff the number of staff, and we also don't have the skills to keep up with it. And this is, you know, not mm. an uncommon story. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to comment about, you know, kind of when you've launched and now you're in that new system and you're feeling like it's almost too much for your organization at that point. I think we had a problem, that problem with Asana. So, um, when we, we we got a new project and we were from two staff, we went up to seven staff, but none of them had used Asana. I got trained from a board member, so that was easy, but training was provided, but then we discontinued because again, it's a matter of even if people want to, organization culture, I really believe in it, but this new change, you know, when you're meeting deadlines, Technology training would be the last thing you're going to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to put it on the side. People want those skills, but they're not willing to spend time in training themselves. So I found that was, we had to discontinue with Asana, although I think Asana was so easy. <laughs> but <laughs> if the team doesn't go with it, then again, you have to see what you've done. We didn't spend money, so we were lucky. But if you've spent millions of dollars on a software or something, then you have to figure out how to train the staff or maybe connect it with some incentives. Yeah. One, um, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, well, I'll, I'll just share one thought and then pass it over to you. You know, what, if, if you're in the position of already having a system that you're feeling is too big or complex, you know, one of the ways we think about it is, you know, just focus on a couple critical use cases, like what's the next thing that you want to be able to do or the one, you know, advancement that you're trying to make or improvement that you're trying to make. And so instead of saying, oh, now I need to learn everything that this new solution can do, I actually just need to learn how I can get this one new thing done. And then that's a, a win and you can, you know, build on that for the next thing that you try to do. Yeah, I was going to share, um... For us, you know, we we tried one platform called Forecast just to identify um, our staff capacity, forecast for the future. You know, who would be who would we be able to staff on a project coming up in a year from now? Uh, it was really challenging. I think it was a platform that we kept trying and trying. We pulled new people in on it. We tried it with five people trying it at a time, and I think you know that was a lesson that maybe this isn't the right platform for us. Um, for an, for a platform that it felt really successful and I feel like has just had a lot of wins is when we really committed to Salesforce. And I think, you know, it took champions internally um, to really push for learning and owning that process. Um, and I think we, we realized that there was a, too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, too many people uh, giving suggestions and, you know, trying new things out and a uh, lot of great ideas, but um, no one really there to implement it. So, you know, having one designated person uh, that really learned it and really identified, okay, like here are the things that we could try and test out. Um, you know, and I've been walking through our team, I, and every time we we try to demo something new, I always ask them, what do you have on a spreadsheet that you hate doing that I could transfer mm -hmm. into a source report? And that feels like the magic question all the time. 
and then I share my screen and then I tell them, okay, you share yours, you walk me through it. And, you know, in, in a way that, that handholding is necessary because, um, you know, at least there's a, there's a lot of trust that's been built already that um, I'm gonna walk them through what they need to know and all the other extra fluffy stuff um, is less concerning for them. And they can really just focus on um, the functions that they need to, to look at. So um, yeah. that's, that's one platform that's worked for us really well. Yeah, just reflecting on what I'm hearing kind of in all three of your answers here is just, it's likely that any tool could be overwhelming. All of these tools out there have so many different options and customizations, and there's three different ways to make Nereal's report. You know, like that that's true of all these systems. So, it, you know, just for whoever asked this question, you're not doing something wrong. Um, this isn't like indicative of a, of a bad investment necessarily, because all of these systems are really complex, robust, whatever marketing term you want to use, right? And instead, I think I hear all three of you saying, we need to start by solving those staff problems. What does staff actually need to do to get their work done? And whether there's 18 different options to do it, what's the one that works for you? How can you be using this tool to kind of successfully do your job every day? And, and that is enough. It's not, the bar is not that you use every function in the tool. It's that you're using the functions that work for your staff, you know, and feeling okay with that. I know we have nine minutes left. I'm going to go share my screen and talk about one more kind of piece of this puzzle. Um, and that was around how we talk about our technology investments. Um, and it turns out we don't. We do not talk about our technology investments. Um, I think there's a lot that, you know, we could all stay on this webinar for five more hours and like deeply unpack the and, and practice some unlearning around this, like, you know, how much of technology is considered overhead and how it's so bad to have that and like all of that BS, right? We have invited it to stay out there um, and not be part of this conversation because everybody here knows technology, without technology, you don't have an organization. You are not running programs. You are not delivering services. You are not meeting your mission. So technology is not some separate shameful expense, but we are still not in the practice of talking about it. Um, there, here's a, a chart I'm putting up around how often do you report on your technology investments to these different teams. Um, the, the only one that has a regular reporting of at least 50% of respondents was the leadership staff. Um, even board was less than half <laughs> of the percent. And I think the groups that really could be better informed so that they then value giving us that financial support, do not get any real material reporting, right? Institutional funders, individual donors, the public, our community are, are not hearing that we are invested in the technologies that support this mission, um, why we're invested in them, how it's going, inviting them into those processes. I think there's really huge opportunity being left on the table here where, where we're not engaging and we're not telling the story of why technology is important to our mission. So curious um, from the three of you, if you'd share maybe some examples of how you have um, told the story of your tech investment um, and, and how that has gone. David, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's looking at that chart that actually I feel like matches even how we communicate. And so like 53% of our leadership, we tell everything about our technology all the time and, and then breaking down that same way. Um, and likewise, probably there's a, a few of our donors that we tell a lot about our technology. I think some of the challenges we have is like the things we want to communicate out um, as an organization technologies for us is, is not the main thing. Like we want to be telling the stories of, of human impact and, and what has really like been, been driving us for a mission. And so how do we get that out there? And how do we drive funding for that? I think where we've seen the success in that is, it goes back to building that relationships with, with other members of our organization, our development team. So that they understand, you know, how that could be, could be coming. And so that they can pick what are those right audiences to select? Um, I don't, I certainly don't drive that communication out from the organization around technology. Um, but when they have an understanding of it and understand that usage, 
uh, we've seen some really great things. We have a, a really major donor that, uh, as we've been talking, having these internal conversations about technology, what it takes to do it. When we first started looking at um, the big digital transformation we're going through now, you know, I came back with, well, here's what talking to multiple consultants out there, this is what's going to take for them to do an analysis of our, our system. And they were like, that's, that's, that's not even close to what we can even think of. And then that wasn't even to analyze, do analysis and replacement, implementation, all that kind of stuff. And but through those conversations and, and from our development officers and president understanding some of those challenges, they were able to present those to the right donors um, and be able to make that part. You know, a gift might be they want to fund uh, changes in Africa if they're really passionate there, but maybe we can earmark 10% of that for operations or, or for you know, some of that for technology to be able to help support what we need to do in those areas um, and that's been really successful um, but it definitely is it's it's to that very narrow audience um, i have no idea how you would properly communicate technology to the larger audience um, i think even a lot of our staff if we told them in detail what we spend money on they'd be like that is way too much um and like i can't afford that i can barely afford my phone and you guys are spending you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on on technology and and for us you know we know and when we talk to consultants like wow you guys do a really great job uh getting that down but uh yeah it's just it's difficult um who you communicate that to mm -hmm. mariela and Breen, final final thoughts I think it's such an important topic. The reporting is a big word, actually, for me. I would say conversations. I think since the pandemic, having those conversations with funders, with donors, with other community agencies has become a little bit easier. But I think us being that literacy sector, I think the funders don't understand what does technology have to do with you guys? You just do literacy, just make people read and write. Right now with this concept of digital literacy, that is, I think now we've started having conversations with our funders, telling them. So I think developing that, having that connection of what you're doing with to, and why you need technology, that connection is very important when you're advocating about technology investments. Mm -hmm. So that's how we were doing it. It's just, mm -hmm. but it is tough because people with the nonprofit sector, funders think you guys don't need that you know, the high tech stuff, uh, <laughs> you can just do your work. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's how we saw it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this is an ongoing question, uh, but something that I promise by we've been really thinking about and are, are putting a lot of thought leadership out on is this, this concept of thriving. So what does it look like for our staff to thrive? What does it look like for communities to thrive? Um, the leaders that we work with. And I think so much of the sector has traditionally um, just seen our work as charity work and, and work that, you know, uh, people do what you can with what, what little that you have. And um, part of our model at, at ProInspire is really, you know, this self-assistance model, you know, uh, how are individuals impacting the sector? How is the sector impacting us? And really disrupting that norm and really thinking through what does it take for the work to thrive and the people that it's impacting to uh, live thriving lives, I think, especially now with this uh, political um, and social climate, um, I think that's at the heart of the, the question. So I think when we when we do that reporting, when we do that storytelling, uh, it's key to what David said, you know, centering the human experience in that. Because at the end of the mm -hmm. day, you know, we want people's lives to to be better. And um, technology is just inherently part of that uh, and, and integrated through all our work to, to be able to thrive. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This was so wonderful. Um, I know we could have talked all that all afternoon um, and I'm prepared to, you know, we can let everybody else go and we can stay. Um, but this is so wonderful. Jet, I so appreciate your partnership and Kaya, um, all of you who've joined us today, thank you so much and know that you are not out there trying to do these projects all by yourself. There's a whole community of us, the, the six of us here today, but um, a whole community behind you and around you and cheering you on. Um, I welcome folks to join some of the online N10 forums. They're totally free to join and um, places where you could ask questions, say, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. Um, and likely three people will say, I do know how to do that. Let me help you. So please know that you're not alone. We, we invite you to join those spaces and 
of course, reach out to Jet or I anytime if we can answer questions or, or get you some support that you need. There's a few links here and, and we'll share these in the you know, recording and the, and the email out to everybody, but some great uh, resources for you to check out and generally just a huge thank you for joining us in this and, and to all of you participating in the research project. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. I'll enjoy the rest of your Thursday. <laughs>